if you've been paying attention to science news for the last decade or so, you've probably repeatedly heard of two of the biggest lies in physics, the Higgs boson and the Higgs field. Now these lies came about because physicists were trying to describe mass in a fundamental way. And currently, mass is treated as an intrinsic property of particles, and they don't know exactly how mass comes apart. So they thought, oh, why not invent another field and another particle that we pretend exists and explains it? Rather than try to get it to it in a more fundamental way without invent inventing a new particle or a new field. And it turns out it's quite simple because electrons and protons scatter light and particles, which means they scatter quantum fluctuations. So they displace quantum fluctuations and they displace quantum field energy or zero point energy. So whenever you have a proton which scatters at its, at its charge radius, it's like a spherical shell that's scattering quantum fluctuations. And if you actually bother to do the calculation, the amount of quantum energy that a proton displaces at its charge radius is equal to its mass. And the same thing is true with an electron if you use a radius that's half the Compton wavelength. And you may say, oh, well, electrons don't have dimensions, but, but they do. And it's also necessary that electrons have dimensions for to have magnetic moment. A point particle can't have a magnetic moment. And it turns out that with the electron, its magnetic moment is equal to a spherical shell with the diameter of the Compton wavelength with the charge of the electron rotating at the speed of light times the G factor, French factor. So in terms of both its mass and its magnetic moment, and also its spin, the electron behaves like it's a Compton-sized shell. Now we know that that shell is transparent, so it more than likely is a shell structure that's made of quantum fluctuations, just like the proton. And yeah, in case you haven't really studied proton physics in terms of the scattering at the at the charge radius of the proton, that scattering behaves like it has thousands of little particles. And what, what physicists normally say is they're quark antiquark pairs. I say instead they're proton antiproton pairs. But either way, you have a shell structure made of quantum fluctuations that's scattering light particles and other quantum fluctuations. And that gives us the mass. And you can imagine a sphere spherical shell with inner and outer diameter and then we have the density energy density equation for the quantum vacuum that we can plug into. I just did a video on the origin of mass that goes into a little more detail and I'll go ahead and link to a paper that describes it in greater detail. And then this applies to neutrons too because neutrons have the same radius as a proton. So it's just displaced quantum field energy. Now this brings out the interesting point that because the proton, electron, and neutron displace the amount of quantum field energy equivalent to their mass, that the total amount of energy in space doesn't change when you include the mass energy. So a theory, say for example, Einstein's general relativity that looks for changes in energy gradient to explain gravity is a false assumption because particles don't change the energy gradient, not when you include the zero point energy of the quantum field. Now we have a little more trickier situation when you're dealing with the mesons and the baryons and the hundreds of unstable particles and the heavier resonances too, like the WZ, Higgs, and Tau. So we have but there's an easy way past that. The, in 1948, and then again in the 60, uh, some physicists, Milne original and then originally, and then Feynman and Sternglass 
discover that there's a relativistic positronium solution. And this positronium solution has energy of approximately 140 MeV per C squared, which is essentially the mass of a pion. And starting to refer refine that number to get an even more accurate uh, estimate of the neutral pion mass. So what they basically showed is that you can model a neutral pion as an electron and positron orbiting each other. And in that case, the extra mass is relativistic mass. And it turns out that you can make a model like that for all the unstable particles. And I did, and I call it the onium theory. And I can account for all the decay products of the particles, and I can account for their mass to a very high degree of accuracy for the most part. There's a few I still need to work out the details. But it turns out that an onium model where you have particles made entirely of electrons, positrons, protons, or antiprotons, and nothing else, well, maybe neutrons, um, that you can account for all the unstable particles that way. And you don't need quarks. And in comparison, here's the old formula for a neutral pion, where you have an up and any up quark minus a down and any down quark divided by the square root of two. Well, you can't divide an elementary particle by the square root of two. And you can't subtract an elementary particle from another elementary particle. And if you have an, a particle and it's any particle, they annihilate, leaving nothing, unless you have a metastable state where they form an onium compound, like positronium. Except in this case, there's no, no evidence that there is up onium or down onium. We've never detected it. So as far as physicists know, it it's, doesn't exist. So we have this nonsense formulation for a neutral pion. And there's six other mesons that have similar nonsense formulations um, that are much better explained using an onium model. And I'll do another video on those another day, as well as uh, go into more details on neutral pion in a separate video. So we can easily account for the mass of all the unstable particles as relativistic mass. And that comes about because there's quantization at 35 MeV and 70 MeV, which is a factor of the electron mass divided by the fine structure constant and the electron mass divided by the fine structure constant divided by two. Um, and the fine structure constant is just the term that gives us the relativistic mass energy, on average. Some refinement of the equations needed on a particle-by-particle -particle basis. Now similarly, you get resonances of relativistic protons. And like with the electrons, you get energy that's related to the fine structure constant. So you have the proton mass divided by the fine structure constant, which is approximately 137, and that gives you 128 GeV per C squared, which is almost precisely the mass of the Higgs boson. Uh, like with the neutral pion being a little bit less than the maximum energy, the mass of the so-called Higgs boson appears to be a little bit less than 128 GeV per C squared. It's, but it's not a surprise. And there's also quantization at half that, at 64 GeV per C squared. And so what physicists think they discovered at the Large Hadron, Hadron Collider at 125 GeV is a resonant proton, resonant relativistic proton. It's not a, a new particle, and it's not anything special. It, they have no evidence that it does anything more than exists. And essentially, it, it exists, and that's, that's about all there is to it. It's just part of the onion model where you have some relativistic proton resonances. 
And I suspect we'll discover more relativistic proton resonances in the future. So explaining mass is quite simple. Uh, Higgs bosons and Higgs fields are totally unnecessary. All you need is the quantum field and relativistic mass, which is a type of quantum field energy related to the inertial energy of a moving particle. And so when you hear tales of Higgs bosons and Higgs fields, it's, it's all a lie. And if you hear someone uh, talking about that, you might bring up the point that the particle's mass is equivalent to the quantum field energy they replace, that mass is zero point energy. Apologize for the motorcycles going by with no muffler. So, I hope you enjoy the video, and I hope you learned something. And if you do, please like, share, subscribe. And if you want to support my research as an independent researcher, I have a Patreon account linked below. And I also have books um, that are for sale. So if you're really interested in learning more about quantum field theory, once again, want to support me, uh, please buy one of my books and, and you can learn more. The latest ones on the onium theory, Goodbye Quarks, the onium theory, which explains that in much greater detail. But I'll be doing some more videos on the onium theory as well so that you can learn more about it. Thanks for watching.